This chapter in your book takes a look at the concerns in political science, particularly emphasized in comparative politics, over authoritarian types of government and also the historical trend that we've noticed really over the past 50 years or so of um, more and more countries transitioning from authoritarian to democracy. So this chapter sort of looks at a couple of um, important illustrations of types of authoritarianism and then toward the end discusses a couple of uh, transitions. The defining feature of authoritarian governments is that they do not rely on popular consent in order to gain their legitimacy. And so, in general, authoritarians retain control of the state within a small number of people. This could take the form of personal networks through a dictatorship, which is generally surrounding one person and or their family. A military dictatorship takes the form of the higher ranking officials being in charge of the government. You may also see the form of dominant parties or cadres as a way of maintaining control in authoritarian governments. And also, finally, religious leadership. This is the case in a place like the Vatican and also in some um, Muslim societies where Sharia law, especially a place like Iran where it is enshrined in the institutions, um, allows for the and relies really on the leadership of leaders uh, within the religion. Your book talks about these examples of hybrid systems that combine the element of elections with their authoritative styles of governing. And going back to our discussion of liberal democracy and illiberal democracies, the only thing that separates these um, systems from being true authoritarian systems is the presence of democ of elections. However, that doesn't mean that they are democratic. In the case of China and Iran, there is sort of government motivated mass mobilization, whether that is for pro government demonstrations or for the um the compulsion to vote. But in both of these cases, who gets to run for elections is highly controlled. In the case of China, it's controlled by the Communist Party. So there are not really competitive elections there. In the case of Iran, the Guardian Council has to approve any um, candidates for office. And this is the high-ranking um, religious officials in the country. And similarly, um, officials in Egypt and Tunisia prior to the Arab Spring were subject to votes and subject to elections, but they manipulated institutions in such a way that they never really lost power due to those elections. So sometimes transitions come about through the intervention of other states, and this can happen by war or through other diplomatic measures. In the case of Germany and Japan, these are maybe the most famous examples of dictators falling because of war. Um, you also have Yugoslavia, Somalia, Afghanistan, and Iraq. Um, left out of there is Argentina, which a lot of people don't know, but they did fall because of their attempt to keep the Falkland Islands, um, or actually to regain the Falkland Islands from the British, and they were actually sorely beaten in the 1980s. Uh, which led to the fall of that dictatorship. North Korea and Taiwan kind of represent our current modern day concerns with dictatorships. Taiwan considers itself dictated really by China and wants its independence. Um, North Korea, the presence of the Kim family for several generations now um, has been a source of concern and paranoia around the world. Another way that foreign intervention has attempted to impact authoritarian governments, and especially to weaken them, is to impose sanctions on them economically through their relationships 
economically with other countries. This has been done in Haiti, Iraq, and Yugoslavia, um, and also in Iran, North Korea, and Cuba. Comprehensive economic sanctions really are sanctions that target the entire economy with the intent to really put pressure on a government. Targeted economic sanctions, on the other hand, are types of sanctions that um, are directed at an activity that the international community would like for that country to stop doing. So, for example, sanctions on the uranium business or uranium sales in, in India or, or Iran, excuse me. Another way that we have attempted to influence authoritarians is tying foreign aid to conditions um, that they strengthen democratic institutions or make some types of democratic reforms, some steps toward democracy. This approach to foreign aid and economic sanctions is highly criticized for its impact on civilian populations. On the domestic level, motivations to transition from authoritarian governments also might come from domestic pressures. So civil society programs that exist really not for government issues still may be a source of threat to authoritarian governments because those are places where people get together without government interference and might be able to organize and, and rebel against a government using these programs. Coups d'etat refer to um, the removal of a leader without institutional process. Generally, that is through military means. Um, sometimes it's through assassina assassination of a leader. Um, popular uprisings sometimes um, are able to make um, authoritarian leaders decide to either transition willingly or resign. Um, sometimes they resign for other reasons. And there is actually shown to be a mixed impact of foreign intervention on authoritarian governments. So philosophically, some argue for a democracy from below, a push from below like what you saw during the Arab Spring with Egypt and Tunisia, uh, Lebanon and Yemen, a lot of these countries pushing for democracy from civil society programs. Foreign intervention, particularly from democracies, has mixed impacts on authoritarian governments and on their populations. Um, one of the reasons for this has been mixed intentions um, on part of the the people intervening, of the governments that intervene. Thinking back to a lot of the justification for the war in Iraq in the early 2000s, um, aside from the discussion of weapons of mass destruction, the justification of spreading democracy to the people oppressed by the Saddam Hussein dictatorship was a really strong argument that was made during that time. But we have evidence really, especially after uh, almost two decades of that war, that foreign intervention doesn't necessarily bring democracy or strengthen the institutions needed for democracy. And again, our intention Tensions there are ambiguous. They, we may be saying one thing, but the intent, you know, is to do something else. So perhaps we say we're going in with the aim for spreading democracy, but the reality is we're trying to secure oil rights. Um, and some other hypocrisies by the United States really point to these ambiguous intentions as well. The United States um, provided aid to the Mubarak regime in Egypt, which was known for being repressive and even while it was repressing the Arab Spring. And the relationship between the United States and Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is one of the biggest human rights abusers and the most oppressive to its citizens um, in the world. Um, and so this really sort of begs the question of whether our intentions are actually true. And 
the question of pressure from democracies arises when you look at Europe and Russia and Europe has really tried to spread democracy further east and to take over areas that used to be influenced by Russia. But this has actually increased the tensions between the strong European powers and Russia. So there are some ambiguities and, and concerns about um, just how, how worthwhile and, and positive the influence from democracies can be. So charting the um, ways that dictatorships have fallen, that authoritarian governments have fallen, historically you see that the impact of foreign intervention is not very strong. Um, assassinations, um, willing full transitions to democracies, uh, coups, which are the most common uh, form of failure, um, these all come in before foreign intervention as reasons that authoritarian governments fall. One important theory about why countries transition um, is modernization theory. Modernization theory was popular in the 1950s and it was a theory that tried to develop kind of a game plan for developing countries. These would be countries that were poor and non-democratic, ways that they could develop politically and economically. And the assumption here was that following the path of Western democracies, um, capitalism and the liberal institutions that they adopted to sort of go with capitalism, that these were vital for democratic transition. And so this basically meant that wealth had to precede democratization. But what we see in the data represented here is that democratization tends to happen at really all kind of levels of income. So there's not a lot of weight to that theory. However, when we talk about democratic survival, the longest living democracies are the ones who are wealthy and democracies are much more likely to break down in poverty. When we look at all of the transitions from authoritarian governments to democratic governments, we often find what we call double transitions. The attempt to move from a more command-centered economy to a more market economy at the same time as you're trying to make democratic reforms and create democratic institutions. This is the case in places like Latin America, in Africa, and in Central and Eastern Europe that used to be um, governed by Soviet or communist governments. And so this can entail a lot of logistical and social, legal, and philosophical problems uh, for society. And one of the biggest issues outside of kind of the upheaval and the uncertainty faced by the population is how to deal in the government with former leaders and the opposition to democracy. Sometimes this has been done through pacts with former leaders by securing them positions in government or giving them immunity for crimes. Um, and this is controversial, right, in terms of human rights observance. So another question here, though, is when it comes to democracy, is force or diplomacy more effective? And should we just choose diplomacy for ethical reasons? And should we intervene when we do? The most recent failures of authoritarian governments began in 2011 with the Arab Spring in Tunisia, Egypt, and other places in the Middle East. And most recently, in 2019, al-Bashir, the president of Sudan, was stepped down due to widespread popular protest against his authoritarian and oppressive policies. He has been accused of human rights abuses by the International Criminal Court. And their um, authority has been really limited, and this is, really points to kind of the weakness of foreign intervention at, 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 at um, really combating authoritarian governments. Um, but the, the 
the failure of the al-Bashir government and the uh, pro-democratic forces um, have not really been as promising as we would have thought. The military junta that is in control wants more um, of a Sharia law approach, whereas pro-democracy protests call for civilian-led government, but they've been shut out of this reform process.